Okay, Brother Sean, you could introduce yourself and it's all yours. Thank you. So blessings, Mike. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And I wanted to say, you know, you talked about me making time. Um, I didn't have a choice, right? Uh, when uh, Real Dads Network uh, makes an ask, uh, makes a call, um, saying no is not a choice, right? And I've been trying to practice getting better with just that saying no. Uh, hardest thing, being spread too thin. You know, I don't know. I'm sure some, some of y'all can relate to uh, you say yes to something uh, in September, and when it's time to do it in December, you're like, damn, why did I say yes? But I just got to say I love Brother Derek um, and, and, and Brother Ishmael. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with giving uh, uh, the CEO and the founder uh, props. And in typical uh, uh, Derek Phillips fashion, uh, he's lifting up everybody else uh, and, and, and deflecting and not want to uh, take uh, all the credit. And, um, you know, that's where I am in my work and my calling and my purpose. Um, you know, I don't want the credit. I want the change. Uh, I have been doing this all my life, um, building community, leading Black male achievement, the most important part of my bio is that uh, I'm married to my divine mate, and I'm the father of uh, Maya, Mia, Cameron, and Caleb. Uh, my twin boys are 20. You know, they're, they're the youngest, and uh, they're adulting uh, and finding their way, right? And, um, you know, two things can be true. Uh, you could be a national leader, Black male achievement, right? And uh, still be like working through the fatherhood thing. And uh, as our children are, are, are growing through um, what it means to be a young young person today. And Derek, I just want to say you just uh, epitomize for me um, the leadership adage of being humble as a lamb, yet bold as a, a, a lion, right? And so, um, like I said, brothers, I was like exhausted, you know, I'm exhausted right now, right? Exhausted and exhilarated, uh, but I'm already getting uh, uh, energy. And I just wanted just to spend a little time and go through uh, um, a couple of slides and a couple of stories, and uh, then we'll uh, just open it up and uh, uh, have a conversation uh, but listen, for me, this is an honor and a privilege. Uh, Derek, I said, when I was in Baltimore earlier this week with Joe Jones at the Center for Urban Families, I was sharing. I was like, look, if somebody would have said to me 34 years ago, they would have said, Sean, if you Google, in 34 years, if you Google Black Male Achievement, your name is going to be synonymous. First of all, I would have said, what the F is Google, <laughs> you know? And secondly, I would have said, shut up and pass the joint, right? And just to say, we just don't know as we're going through stuff, what God has in store for us, man. And, uh, you know, in my book, I write about coming to the end of, uh, you know, my run with drugs and alcohol and, uh, you know, I had a plan of uh, just jumping on the tr tracks at 34th Street and Penn Station because I could not see any feasible way out of the grip of my uh, addiction. And uh, God intervened. God intervened. And uh, for the last, you know, well, right before the pandemic, 12 years before the pandemic, that same platform that I stood on that I was going to jump but I got on a C train of town was the same platform that I would get on to go to work to the offices of the campaign for black male achievement, right? And I just think it's real important just to lift that up because uh, we be holding a lot. Um, depression is real. 
the weight that we carry. And, you know, we're quick to say, I'm good. I got it. Don't want to ask for help. Thursday, every day at four o'clock is therapy for me, right? And that's part of, you know, people at my company know, you know, don't schedule nothing Thursday at four o'clock. So I just wanted just to come in with that spirit. Uh, wanted to uh, bring in my sister, uh, Susan L. Taylor, uh, whom I was with last night. And uh, one of the things that Susan said to me, uh, this was wow, back in 1997, and uh, I was running a Beacon School in Harlem you know, on 144th Street. And we were publishing a youth newspaper called Harlem Overheard. And we would have, uh, during the Kwanzaa season, a Kwanzaa speaker series for seven straight weeks. And she was a speaker one year. And uh, Susan packed the house. It was like 600 uh, 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 people, standing room only in the uh, auditorium. And uh, you know, be someplace and somebody say something. It's for everybody but you know it's for you. And what she said was, the essence of success is that you have to show up fit, focused, organized, disciplined, and with the plan. And I was like, that was powerful, right? And so I've been running uh, 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 with that as well. Um, and so brought a few other folks uh, 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 with me uh, 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 tonight. And um, did I, what did I recently, didn't, I, I recently had a book talk uh, for, for Real Dads, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, so, so I think these, are, these might be some of the same slides. You know, I, I, it is. Okay, all right. So, I, you know. What you, have the, you, have, you have Jared there um, from Black Man Reading. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's, hey, hey, hey. that's what it was. Okay. So some brothers weren't on that, but... Uh, some of this stuff is bears repeating. So uh, uh, Ishmael and Derek, some of this stuff uh, you are, are going to uh, have heard and seen. And Derek and I have been rolling for about 15 years. So he done heard everything, right? And uh, uh, I met Derek when I was publishing a newspaper called Proud Papa for African-American fathers. And uh, we partnered, uh, Derek created the Daddy Daughter Dance and uh, me, Derek and Kenny Braswell from Fathers Incorporated. We were like the three the hard way in the fatherhood field in uh, New York. And we were uh, just partnering and, and supporting each other. And uh, and so you may have seen this uh, slide, you may have heard this quote, uh, but it certainly bears repeating. So I brought Aaron Dottie Roy with me. And uh, what Aaron Dottie Roy said at the outset of the pandemic, she said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And uh, that's the question. We're talking about deep end leadership and the seven C's of uh, deep end leadership. And I'll get into the C's. Um, what are we leaving behind? What are we leaving behind in the pandemic, right? And uh, I guess, you know, the worst thing that could happen is uh, emerging from a pandemic the same way we went into it. Now, I came in a couple pounds heavier, but during the pandemic, the transition that I made internally was powerful. Uh, the pandemic for me was kind of like an intermission season between my second act and my third act of my leadership journey. And through reflection, through therapy, I realized that my second act was all about external approval, proving that I was a leader, outside validation. And what the pandemic allowed me to do uh, was some serious internal work and stop so much relying on extrinsic, external validation and intrinsic, uh, internal validation. This is brother Melvin Miller said to me right before, in 2019 at a retreat, right before the pandemic in a retreat. And I've been running with this. It's another scenario where um, there was a staff retreat for the campaign for black male achievement. He said it to the whole team I was like, he's talking to me. And what he said to me, 
was you have nothing to prove, only gifts to share. For me, that was like a weight lifted to embrace uh, uh, embrace that, right? And so, uh, you know, wanted to bring that. Also wanted to bring in, uh, this is a, 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 a image from um, a uh, exhibit that was um, traveling the country. And when the pandemic hit, they had to do it outside. And this was Ford Motor Company. It was called Men of Change. So some of y'all may have seen that. You know, they've been all across the nation. Uh, right now, they're in Baltimore at the uh, Reginald F. Lewis uh, uh, Museum. And uh, I was on like like the selection panel, but I didn't even know that they had used one of my quotes uh, for the exhibit, right? And uh, and you know, if uh, anything, what I tell leaders, right? you know, stop stoning on your calling, right? And uh, there is no cavalry coming to save the day in our communities. We are the iconic leaders that we have been waiting for, the curators of the change that we're seeking to see. And for me, I was, I was like, oh man, y'all got me on a, 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 a placket with Sojourner Truth, right? And uh, so that, I, that was real exciting. But what she said also, uh, was pretty powerful. And what Sojourner Truth said was, I am for keeping the thing going while things are stirring. Because if you wait till it's still, it will take a great while to keep it going. And so like, the question is like, what are you stirring? What are you keeping going? I've been watching Derek for uh, a decade and a half with real, uh, 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 you know, the Real Dads Network ebbs and flows, ebbs and flows, sometimes a lot happening, sometimes, you know, not so much, but that commitment and that longevity, brother, you've kept it stirring. You kept stirring it, right? And now that you're retired, the momentum is uh, building. You have more time uh, 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 for it, right? So I'm gonna speed it up a little bit, but this is my hero, Muhammad Ali. I brought Muhammad Ali into the uh, room and Muhammad Ali said, uh, he, uh, who is not courageous enough to take risks will not accomplish anything in life. And so what's the risk that we need to be taking? What's the risk that you're thinking about as a leader, as a father, that you're not taking? Also got uh, Terry Williams uh, bringing her into the room as well, into uh, this space. And Derek, I don't know if... Uh, uh, you know that uh, Terry Williams, uh, she's ailing from Alzheimer's uh, and she is in uh, long-term uh, care. Um, and what I love about Terry is I remember in 2005 when uh, she published this article in Essence magazine where she pulled the covers on her own clinical depression. And She's written a number of books, but there's one particular book that she wrote uh, called Black Pain. And the subtitle of that was, it just looks like we're not hurting. And I just want to say like, what we're doing right here, right now, black men coming together on a regular basis, getting vulnerable, um, a generation ago, we would be called soft. We would be called punks. I remember having separate conversations with my biological father and my father-in-law and them telling me the story of the point when they left their families. Now, my biological father, I didn't grow up with him. He and my mother were never married. He's talking about the family that he started uh, with someone else, and they both used the same phrase. It was eerie. They both said, I felt the walls were closing in on me, and so I left. And I said, you know what? How many times have I had that feeling of the walls closing in on me? But I'm just blessed. We are all blessed that we, are, we have come of age in a generation where it is okay for me to go to another brother and for me to say, oh, brother Mike, I'm scared. That it's okay 
for another brother to say I love you and there's like no implications. Like, hold up, I'm not gay. What are you talking about? And I had to think like, my father-in-law's generation and my father's generation, they had to white knuckle it when they were going through stuff. So I don't want anybody on this uh, uh, call, and I know that you know you wouldn't be here, but this is a privilege and how blessed we are as men to come together. And so Terry Williams uh, said a couple of things uh, that has resonated and has stayed with me. Uh, she said, what you think is your curse could be your calling in disguise. And what she also said was, and she said this to a group of young people, I used to publish a, a, a newspaper in Harlem, uh, a youth newspaper called Harlem Overheard. And I brought her in to speak and uh, she said to the kids, um, she said, if you're not leaving the house most days to do what you're called without butterflies in your stomach, your life is pathetic. I was like, damn, that's kind of harsh, Terry, to be saying to the kids, right? Uh, but my wish for everybody on this uh, uh, Real Dads Club, um, that you have butterflies, that you're not complacent, that you're building and you're doing stuff and you're still striving, no matter how old you are, that you got butterflies in your stomach because of what God has called you to do. So I'm going to be 60 in uh, September. And when I was a young man, I thought at 60, and this is why this health piece is so important. When I was a young man, at, I thought that 60, I would be shopping for my rocking chair. I would be pushing the cruise control button. But as I approached 60, I'm like, I'm just getting started. I'm just entering the third, act, you know, the, 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 the third act uh, of my leadership and my life journey. And I still want butterflies. And I'm still doing stuff that's scaring the shit out of me, right? And so I wish you all uh, 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 butterflies. I'm also bringing in the uh, spirit of uh, Mamie Till, right? And uh, there's a movie uh, coming out called Till. And uh, Derek, I'm working with uh, Joshua Dubois uh, and his company that's uh, doing some community marketing around the movie uh, uh, Till. Um, and this really speaks to, for me, what Terry Williams said, what you think could be your, 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 your curse, could be your calling uh, in disguise. And what Mamie Till did was she had to make a decision. When Emmett Till's body came back to Chicago from Money, Mississippi, in that summer of 1955, and she had to identify the body and saw this grotesque figure, her son, her 14 year old son, she made a decision that uh, helped ignite the civil rights movement. And she said, we're gonna have an open casket. Thank God for uh, black media. One of my mantras is we have to be masters of our own media. Ebony Jet put that image of Emmett Till in the casket and it shocked the world. But uh, something that um, Mamie Till Mobley said was, we are only given a certain amount of time to do what we were sent here to do. You don't have to be around a long time to share the wisdom of a lifetime. You just have to use your time wisely, efficiently. There is no time to waste. That sense of urgency, right? I'm just bringing that into uh, uh, the place tonight, right? And so I'm a poet. I also- I say that again, uh, brother. Langston Hills with me. And the title of uh, my book, we borrow from Langston Hughes's poem, I Too Am America, on loving and leading Black men and boys. And I want to just bring in the spirit of Langston. Brother, Brother right, Sean? You. Yeah. Brother Sean, we have a request that you repeat that last quote. Oh, from Mamie Till Mobley? Yes, sure. thank you. 
we are only given a certain amount of time to do what we were sent here to do. You don't have to be around a long time to share the wisdom of a lifetime. You just have to use your time wisely, efficiently. There is no time to waste. And I'm never asked to repeat that. I want to just thank you because you jarred something, right? So I'm just going with the flow. I'm in the matrix. We're going to come back to uh, uh, Langston in a second. This uh, tomorrow is no guarantee, no time to waste. When I was running a Beacon School on 144th Street in Harlem, we uh, opened the school seven days a week uh, from 8 a.m. in the morning to nine o'clock at night, even on the weekends. And on the weekends, uh, we hosted a girls basketball tournament called Slam Jam. And Slam Jam was run by this brother, Clyde Frazier Jr. Uh, some of you may know him, Derek. I don't know if you uh, knew Clyde Frazier Jr. Uh, if you knew Clyde, you know, uh, say, you know, let me know in the chat. And let me tell you this, uh, uh, and, and thanks again for asking the, me to repeat the quote. He was passionate about, Slam Jam was the, the leading girls basketball tournament in the city. And I remember Saturday and Sunday mor uh, mornings, we'd open the gym for him to have practice and have the tournament games. He uh, lived in Queens. I remember I moved from uh, 110th Street in Harlem to Queens. It was right across the street from him. And the tournament grew so much, he stopped running it out of our Beacon School and he started doing the games at St. John's University. I will never ever forget the morning of September 10th, 2001. I bumped into Clive Frazier on Hillside Avenue and a hundred and uh, I want to say 88th Street was where the Chase Bank was in Queens. And he had some Monday morning banking business to do and I had some Monday morning banking business to do. And he shared with me, you know, he had to tell, you know, he came to the bank before he went to work. And we stood on Hillside Avenue and he was sharing the passion. He worked for IRS law enforcement, right? But his passion was slam jam and on that hillside avenue jamaica queens corner he was just telling me all his dreams about it right and i've seen the seed and watched it grow and how passionate it was the next day he went to work on time and clive fraser jr perished in the south tower of 9-11 and that's always stuck with me because if he would have decided to go to the bank on that Tuesday morning instead of that Monday morning, he would have missed the attack. And that made me tell, we don't know. We don't know. In the event that I was at last night, I don't know if you, anyone knows, uh, brother remembers Bernard Tyson. Bernard Tyson was the CEO of, uh, um, uh, what's the name of the healthcare place? Uh, Kaiser, Kaiser uh, Parlamente or something like that. And in 2019, in November, died in his sleep. And his wife, I met her in Ghana uh, I was part of the uh, Essence Full Circle Festival. Uh, that was my first trip to Ghana. And she was there and she was grieving. And last night, Susan Taylor uh, brought her to this event. And she reminded me because shortly after I saw her, when I was in Belize, I was having a nighttime dream. I don't know if you ever have those nighttime dreams. You can't move, you can't breathe. And I, did, I was fighting in my dream and my wife shook me up. And I felt if my wife didn't wake me, I might not have woken up. And so if anything, right, just seize the moment, brothers. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. All right, just uh, 
had to show you all that I was always, not always this fat and bald. Uh, that's me from my uh, balling days. One of my regrets is not playing against Derek, right? Because, you know, Derek be doing a humble brags, right? And we never had a chance. Like, right now, I know he still is in, he's in much better shape. I couldn't, like, maybe I might be able to do a, a, a three-point contest with him, right? But, you know, I see these brothers, you know, that, you know, God, I wish I would have saw them in my heyday, you know? So, uh, you know, Derek sending me videotapes of him dunking and whatnot on humble brags, uh, that was just a missed opportunity, Derek. Uh, never got an opportunity to uh, uh, get you on the court. But uh, yeah, I remember, those, you know, that Citywide and them rugged T-shirts that I used to have, I would wear it. Those were my colors, man. Those were my sense of... Uh, uh, uh. So, Ishmael, did I talk about UCLA? Uh, the University of the Corner of Lenox Avenue, I already talked about that. So uh, I'm not going to go uh, into that. Uh, but for those of you that weren't on my uh, session, with um what was it um brothers reed what was the name of the group uh, black man reading with jared woods yeah yeah black uh black man reading what i shared was that i had a phd from ucla and that's the university on the corner of lennox avenue and that's the block right there 119th street and uh, uh, uh lennox avenue playing freeze tag playing scullies hot peas and butter talked about one of the lessons I learned was like about scared money don't win when the other brother, older brothers were playing dice and craps, right? And so uh, everything I needed to know, I learned by the time I was nine years old at UCLA, the university on the corner of Lenox Avenue. So I'm gonna get into uh, the seven C's of uh, deep end leadership. And um, just wanna let you know, uh, uh, kind of run through them. I may stop and spend a little bit more time on others and then uh, just leave us some time just to open it up and uh, uh, talk, right? And so people are like, you know, what is deep in a uh, uh, leadership, right? And so, you know, most novice swimmers, right? Uh, or anyone who has uh, mistakenly ventured into waters above their head for that matter, can recall like that awful feeling uh, in their stomach that screamed, oh my God, I am in the deep end and this water is over my head. I felt that way parenting. I felt that way as a husband. I felt that way as a, a, a leader. Uh, uh, and when you're feeling in over your head, there's a saying, and you might, if you're in over your head, you might as well go deeper, right? And this is a time when, you know, you gotta employ your, 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 your leadership skills. Your ability to float, your ability to doggy paddle. Uh, sometimes you gotta ask for help and for a lifeguard to uh, 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 save us, right? And so whether we are in the proverbial deep end waters in our world of work, parenting, relationship, entrepreneurship, pursuing your God-given living, we must be prepared for those times when we find ourselves screaming on the inside. I am in over my head. So our leadership skills is a linchpin on how we realize what God has given us to do in this journey of life, right? So deep in leadership is when brothers like you all on this call decide to stop swallowing in the shallowing of your leadership lives and begin to challenge yourself to go deeper. And I know y'all all doing some dope stuff, but we all can go deeper, right? Because we, we, we can make a splash in shallow waters, right? Um, we create waves waiting in the shallow end, but 90% of all what God has called for us is in deep waters, right? And But so many people are like, frozen on the edge. They don't even jump in. They'll criticize, make fun, and judge you uh, 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 even in the shallow end, right? So deep in leadership is when you decide to dive in or wade in above your head, above your capabilities, right? And so the seven C's are uh, calling, courage, completion, credibility, collaboration, change, and coaching, right? 
And the first one is a, 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 a calling. And I firmly believe that we are all called to a unique leadership uh, assignment, that we all have a calling, right? I would venture to say that while uh, a brother Derek uh, had a long career as a teacher and developed talents as an instructor and a teacher, to me, he's called to lead Real Dads Network, that that is his calling, right? And so deep in leaders know that they have a particular calling on their lives and that their primary job is to discover their unique purpose and mission, the very reason why they were born. Discovering your true calling will lead you to the right people, places, and projects where you can best utilize your talents. Unfortunately, most people never discover their calling. Most people take their callings with them to the grave. Ask yourself, what would you do because you love it so much that you would do it for free? What comes easy to you? What are your strengths? Write down your strengths. And if you don't know, ask somebody, what am I good at? So the first C in deep in leadership is calling and discovering your calling. I read a book about 22 years ago called The Path by Laurie Beth Jones about discovering your mission in life. And in that book, there was assignments, right? And I discovered that what I was already doing, that my calling is to, to, to write, to speak, to publish, to inspire and share sex uh, success principles, well, not sex, but success principles, <laughs> and lift others up, right? And that's what I'm called to do. And no matter what, that's why I'm here, right? When I was saying, God, I'm tired, I don't want to show up tonight, this is my calling. I got to show up. So that's the first one. Ask yourself, what are you good at? The second calling is courage, because you can have a great calling, be all inspired, right? and be like, oh, this is what God has called me to do. But if you don't have the courage to do the first act, your calling don't mean a thing, right? Once deep in leaders discover their calling, they summon the courage to respond to it. And I talked about uh, uh, learning on, at UCLA, the university on the corner of Lenox Avenue, and that whole saying of scared money don't win when the older brothers were playing dice. And it wasn't until I got into the game that I realized what they meant was scared money don't win. Is that if you don't bet, you can't win. The most fruitful thing that you can do in this moment, and I hope all of you are keeping journals, right? Journaling has been part of my personal and spiritual development practice for mostly all of my life. I've been journaling since I was 15. It's part of my morning uh, 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 practice, right? My morning mission fuel practice. Uh, if, you, if you're a journaler, write in your journal. Uh, what would you do if you were 10 times bolder? Not just that you're going to do it, but what would you do if you were 10 times bolder? Our worst fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your plain small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God within us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. What's holding you back, brothers? 
to go into the next level? What's the fear? What's that thing that's holding you back? When I re-entered therapy a few years ago, one of the first questions my therapist asked me, she said, why are you dimming your light? And my response, I was like, hold up, don't you know who I am? I'm showing that, what do you mean dimming my light? But she was right. I had a little threshold. I would only go that far, but I had a whole lot of fear. And I still do every day. I wake up and I'm like, come on, let's go at it, fear. But she said, it's like, it's not our darkness. And that was a poem that uh, Marianne Williamson wrote and uh, Nelson Mandela made it really famous when he was released from a, a prison and he recited it in his uh, first speech, right? And he got a lot of credit for that uh, uh, poem. And it's not that it's our uh, 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 darkness, but why are we scared of our life? What do we do to sabotage, self-sabotaging behavior because we're fearful of our own light, fearful of our gifts, fearful of our own success, right? So, and this is a process, right? This is not like, oh, take, I, I'm courageous now. It's always something else to me that challenges our courage, right? So the first thing is calling. Well, the Do song, know. Well, yes, the sir. Song, so sorry. Um, before you go to the next C, um, we have a hand that's raised, um, Ishmael. Sure. No, this is a conversation, so stop me at any moment. All right. Ishmael, you're muted. Uh, can you type on courage? Because often, I like that word courage, because often we, we kind of fear ourselves from doing the right thing because of white comfortability. So can you kind of tap onto that courage against white comfort, white comfortability? Did you say white comfortability? Yeah. All right, tell me what you mean by white comfortability. Often as black people, instead of just telling how we feel or act on how we feel, we kind of navigate depending on making white people feel comfortable. Yeah. And so I think that that's a situational, um, Courage, right? Sometimes uh, if it's a work environment or if you're being stopped by a police, a policeman, sometimes courage is telling you to say something, but common sense and wanting to get out of that situation alive is a different uh, scenario, right? And so one of the things, and particularly in white spaces, is being able to have uh, if it's not in your place where you are, colleagues, allies, Black folks that you're able to like, you know what, share with them what you're going through. And so there are many, this is why entrepreneurship and being your own boss is uh, 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 important, right? There are many unemployed brothers because they decided they were going to be courage, courageous in a work environment where they don't have the power and authority, but they wanna be courageous, but now they're looking for, for a job, right? And so, so much of that, of what you're bringing up, Ishmael, is um, that whole, what I started out with earlier about saying, I have nothing to prove and only gifts to share. So that's one thing. And I think the other thing around courage is, you know, the safety in numbers and, and who has your back, right? Um, you know, we all grew up in a time when, you know, folks came on the block and they said there was static, right? That there was beef. You know, quite frankly, I would look around and see who was on the block and see if it was a good day for a, a, a static, right? And getting folks to uh, 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 help you, right? And so I don't even know if that's answering your uh, 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 question, right? Because I think you can, sometimes the courageous thing is, you know what, I got some information. I'm not gonna respond to it right now or respond to it impulsively. I'm gonna store this information and use it in a timely uh, timely manner, right? So sometimes, and, and, and I think is the, the comfortability is less about white comfortability, it's about your comfortability. It's mm -hmm. about our comfortability as a black man. 
And I'm not saying in any way, like demean yourself or, or, or allow yourself to be treated uh, in a demean, you know, we got to stand for something, right? Um, but it's really being, I think, like strategic around what is uh, a, a courageous, right? Um, <laughs> I'm thinking like, like what Will Smith did to uh, Chris Rock was like, was that courageous? No, nah, I don't think that was courageous, right? The courageous thing is like, all right, let me talk to you af backstage, man to man, not on camera and all of that. And it didn't express, and I'm not even saying uh, uh, physically attack him backstage, but what he did was the cowardice thing. That was easy. He knew he had all kinds of back. He can go up and do that, right? Sometimes the courage thing is not acting us like impulsively. It's like showing some self control. Calling, courage completion. You know, Stephen Covey in his uh, classic leadership book uh, talked about the seven, in the seven habits of highly effective people. Uh, he says that uh, highly effective people begin with the end in mind, right? And so deep in leaders, when we get completion, uh, they ask success look like. They write down vision statements. Uh, with goals and, and, and what the, the, the completion will look like. I will tell you one of the most powerful leadership exercises that I've done a few years ago when my executive coach was write my own eulogy. And we had in this discussion, we all gonna die, right? We all gonna die. What do we want our eulogy to say. And we went through this assignment and a whole lot of the stuff, the awards, campaign for black military, all that stuff was way on the bottom. Relationships with family, my wife, my children was high up, right? Write your own eulogy. Have a sense of like a completion and write vision statements. So the fourth C is a, a, a credibility. And I talk about um, credibility being that dip in the pool. Now, y'all know that, you know, for those of you that can't swim, uh, there's this dip in the pool where at one point, you know, you're cool, you cool, your feet can touch the bottom of the pool, you start splashing around, and the next thing you know, there's a dip and you're in over your head. If you can't swim, you're in trouble. We have seen so many black men, talented, gifted, get to the dip in the pool and drown. I will quickly say uh, for so many of us, if it ain't the money, it's the honey. If it ain't the money, it's the honey. Now, none of us are perfect, right? We're talking about going into deep end. We're not talking about walking on water, right? We're talking about going into deep end. Like right? we all have our imperfections, right? But credibility is all about trust. And one, do I trust myself? And do I trust people, no matter what, you, you may have the best product, but if people don't trust you, they're not gonna do business with you. And so, this is a, 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 a book called uh, Credibility, How Leaders Gain It and, 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 and Lose It and While People Demand It. And uh, the authors say, leaders make an impression. They leave their footprints in the sand and these become guides for those who come from behind. To the extent that people have positive and consistent images of their leaders in their heads, they will want to be like them and act in ways that are consistent with shared values. And so that is for me, it's like, what are people saying about you when you're not around? And what are the areas that you know you need to work on? It might be punctuality. It might be honesty. It might be the money. 
it might be the honey, right? But that is that divided line credibility. And it's so hard to gain and it's so easy to lose with one bad decision. We've all had that, uh, 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 that moment, right? I've been telling brothers, if you see me running down the street 100 miles an hour, don't look, wait, God, where's Sean running to? Look at what and who I'm running from, right? Uh, uh, you know, you gotta know your areas and your, 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 your weak areas and where the enemy's gonna try and, try and get you, right? And so I'll, I'll just park that right there. So uh, the next C, the fourth C is collaboration. And um, Derek, you're a prime example. I've seen you grow from kind of doing Real Dad's Network, almost solo, to getting brothers on board. Some of them, if not all of them, volunteering. My brother Keith joining your team, uh, Ishmael, you got Mike. If we want to do something big, we cannot do it alone. And when I think about collaboration, I always think about the parable of the talents, right? And very popular parable. Uh, we all know it, you know, uh, the, the, the Lord of a, a vineyard was going on a far country and he uh, called three of his servants and he gave one five talents, one two, and the other brother he gave one and went off on his journey. The brother with the five talents went out into the marketplace and he doubled his five. He hustled and he doubled his five. The brother with the, the two talents did the same thing, right? He went out and he hustled and he doubled his, uh, uh, his two talents. But the brother, with the one talent, what did he do with his one talent? He buried it, right? Why did he bury it? Because he was scared, right? And the parable says they were each given talents according to their ability. And I would always think about what would the remix of the parable of the talents look like? What if the brother with the five talents went and found a brother with the th two talents and said, let's go find a brother with the, the one talent, helped him dig up his one talent, and they put all of their talents together and they formed three servants incorporated and went into business together. And when the master came back, they were all blessed. This area right here, and I was just dealing with this in Baltimore, I was down there for a talk. We had 50 leaders in the room. And I said, this feels like the same conversation that we were having in 2009. And overwhelmingly, it was because of a lack of collaboration. And even before that, what I was talking about credibility and folks trusting each other. Collaboration is the fifth C because if we want to do big stuff, we, we can't do it alone, right? And we all heard of the adage, uh, teamwork uh, equals dream work, all right? A couple more, and then we're going to just uh, open it up. Uh, change uh, is the sixth C. Uh, shift happens. Adversity uh, 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 happens. Um, it's not about, you know, it's about how high uh, you bounce, right? And if you're doing big stuff, Something's going to happen. You're going to have setbacks. And it's how we handle those setbacks. Change could be crisis. How we bounce back. At the, during like three months into the pandemic, we had to make a decision to sunset my not-for-profit, the campaign for Black Male Achievement. We were experiencing organizational conditions, uh, precondition. And we made the tough decision to sunset. But I had the attitude, don't get bitter, get better. I always had a vision for creating a corporation for Black Male Achievement. And I said, you know what, we're gonna turn this into an LLC. But I always 
failed. I failed. And I had folks have to remind me, hold up, the campaign for Black Metal Achievement was only supposed to be a three-year campaign. Here you are 12 years into it, and look at all that you have seeded. For me, I had to like reframe my relate what I thought was failure. If you can reframe your semen failure, you can reframe your future. So it's changed, right? And, and, and some of us have taken a setback that we still haven't gotten over. It may not be a business setback or a work setback. It might be a relationship setback that we're still holding on to, that we're still bitter about, right? Success leadership comes with adversity. If you're not like dealing with adversity, if you're not dealing with resistance, you're not like doing what Terry Williams said, right? You're not going out there with butterflies in your stomach, right? And so it's so much how you respond to change, to crisis and uh, adversity. And you know, I'm, I got, you know, 33 years of recovery. I thought drug addiction was the worst thing in my life. Let me take my life. But that was the catalyst for changing my life around. If I would have jumped on them chat tracks, all the things that I've done in the last 30 years, including my children, including my wife, would have never have come into fruition. And I started this conversation and say every Thursday at four o'clock, I'm in therapy. And sometimes there's some change uh, uh, that you need some professional help. Can't pray it away. Need to get into counseling. Trauma. I write about trauma in my book. I write about when I was nine years old and I got abducted the first time I traveled the subways by myself going from the Bronx to Harlem. And on the way back, instead of getting on the uh, uptown side, I got on the downtown side and I got lost. I was wearing a fur coat that the numbers runners thought that cute little bushy hair Sean should have a fur coat. I got abducted, got the fur coat stolen. And all my life, I used to tell that story as my Harlem resiliency story. It wasn't until later on 57 years old in therapy and also on a retreat with a trusted leadership circle that I discovered. Hold up, two things could be true. Yeah, Sean, that was, you were resilient on that day. But that was trauma. I cried more as a, as a 57 year old than I did as a nine year old. And so many of us are holding on to un recognized and unreconciled trauma. And then we want to go out here and we want to lead and we want to build, but we're bringing our trauma with you. So, you know, shift, shift happens. All right, let me just quick go with these last, um, I might've skipped one, maybe not. That was this number seven, coaching. Um, so yeah, so, I tell all leaders, you know, you, you got to have a mentor, you have to have a therapist, and you have to have an executive uh, a, a coach. And um, deep in leaders know that they need coaches. Even Michael Jordan needed a coach. LeBron needed a coach. Uh, I don't know who y'all rooting for in the finals. I'm rooting for Golden State. Can't mm -hmm. stand Boston. But we all uh, 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 need a coach. And now, while we're complete uh, and believe in that, you know, uh, we're complete. There's still work for us to do. So get an executive coach. And I love, so we've all done some dope things in our lives. Every brother on this screen has done some dope things and have been successful and have some wins. I believe that the thing that God really truly wants you to deliver to the world you're not gonna do it alone. And I tell the story, and, and, and I may have told this story, uh, Ismail, did I tell the story of uh, the Caleb breach story? 
um, Caleb Breach story. And Caleb is my last born uh, a child, uh, twin boys, Cameron and Caleb. And I tell the story how I was in the delivery room for uh, the delivery of all four of my children. Uh, Nia, my firstborn, uh, I was late to the fatherhood game. I was like 31, maybe going on 32. All my homeboys were like, oh, you're shooting blanks, what's going on? And when Desiree told me in the morning, you know, her water broke, I was like, stop playing. But Nia, I took pictures, leaving the apartment, getting on the elevator, getting in the cab. I was so excited uh, going into the hospital old days when you had the uh, disposable cameras, you know, you had to send it to the uh, uh, a drugstore and wait for a whole week to get it back. That's how Nia's delivery was. Maya, my second born was different. Uh, my wife was moaning in the middle of the night. I'm like, what are you moaning about? She said, I'm having contractions. We had moved from Harlem to Queens. And uh, I wanted to drive back to New York Hospital in Manhattan. And she said, no, I'm not going to make it. We had to go to Jamaica Hospital. Maya burst on the scene one hour after the first contraction. Um, my twin boys were different. My wife had to go on bed rest uh, 19 weeks into the pregnancy. She had to get what's called a surclage. When it was time for her to deliver, they were not ready to do a C-section. And she pushed my first son out, Cameron. But no matter how hard Desiree pushed, Caleb was not coming out. And Caleb was what you call breach. He was turned around. We know babies come out head first. He was foot first. And they tried to, you know, they weren't ready for a C-section. They were trying to move uh, 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 the belly. Nine minutes after his twin brother, Cameron, was pushed out. And Desiree, don't, this was the third baby she done pushed out. We done pushed out some dope stuff. Nine minutes after uh, Cameron was uh, pushed out, Caleb's vital signs began to drop. And the doctor said, I got to go in and pull him out. And pulled Caleb out, breach. Wife screaming, digging her nails in my uh, arms. <laughs> but went in. It saved Caleb's life, right? He's 20 years old now, right? Um, and you know, this has been the season when I've been saying, I brought you into the world and I'll take you out, right? That's a whole nother conversation. But I want you brothers to know what the coaching is, is that sometimes we have to get vulnerable and go to another brother and say, I got something inside of me and I need your help to pull it out. Sometimes we gotta get in what I call emotional and spiritual stirrups. And we say that to, man, to a man, stirrups, please, right? And getting open. And I've said this like over the years, only one time when I, I would say, Any, anybody been in stirrups before? Only one brother of all the workshops and he said, it's a long story, right? So I thought maybe it was some kind of medical condition. We couldn't get it. But sometimes we just like our pride, asking for help, receiving coaching, whatever is that thing that's inside you that you're hitting your head on a pillow at night and you're dreaming about, you're wondering like, how come this ain't working? We got to go to somebody and ask for help and say, I got this thing inside of me. And so calling, we all have a leadership calling. But we need to have the greatest calling ever. If we don't have courage to act, that calling don't mean anything. Completion, begin with the end in mind. Write a vision statement. What does it look like at the end? Write your eulogy. People think that's a, a sobering act. It's a, a, a morbid act. Writing your, liber, your, your eulogy is a liberating act. And how you want to see what your expected end looks like. Credibility is around trust and us dealing with the shortcomings that we have in our life. Collaboration. 
what we're building alone. You know, Les Brown used to say, you know, you can bake a cake by yourself in the kitchen, right? But uh, if you're trying to like launch Entenmann's or, 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 or uh, uh, a, a big pie company, no, you're gonna need some collaborators, right? You can't do that by yourself. And change and responding to change, that's one thing that's constant, right? Don't get bitter, get better. And the seventh C is coaching, right? And coaching is also community. What we have right here, Real Dads Club, is coaching. And I know that, that what happens here, folks are coming to each other, brothers are coming to each other and um, saying, I need help. And I just want to find uh, in your deep end, uh, are your sunken treasures. You will find your gold. You will find what I call your G spot, which is your God spot, which is your gift spot, which is your genius spot, which is your gold spot because you have treasure inside of you. And I just want to close with a poem that I dedicate to my poetry teacher that helped me uh, discover my gold for writing, for poetry, for reciting poetry, for public speaking. And if ever the time for you to dig deep within, it is now if only you would decide and begin. Mining your soul for your very gold is why you are here, so dig deep and be bold. It is your purpose, your life's divine mission. It is your calling, so just get still and listen. And you will hear an old so sweet sound telling you where your goal can be found. And you'd be wise to not let another moment fly by as the day will come when you'll surely die. Then the question for you will resoundingly be, did you dig deep for your gold for the world to see? Mining your soul for your buried gold is why you are here. So dig deep and be bold. Thanks for having me brothers and thanks for uh, lifting me up. And uh, uh, I started, I Recording in progress. And when I started, and, uh, 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 to be a part of uh, you know, Real Dad's Week, right? And so I think we got a few minutes just to open it up and uh, 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 kick it. Well, Brother Sean, first of all, I personally want to thank you very much for such an inspiring presentation. I mean, you challenged us, you motivated us, and you stirred with us, in with us, a fire especially at this week where we're planning new things for the Real Dads Network. Um, Derek, Uncle Derek, we're gonna have to really talk after this talk. <laughs> so we thank you, we thank you so much. Do um, any brothers have any comment? We have a few minutes, um, Brother Sean is here. Any questions or comments? Yes, Ola from Nigeria. Can you sacrifice yes, decide to be here? Please talk. Uh, Ola, you're in from uh, Nigeria? Yes, Brother Sean. Uh, and uh, uh, coincidentally, I got to know one of your friends, Ashanti Branch. So Yes, yes, that's my brother Ashanti. Yeah, yeah he's, a good, he's, a, he's a very good friend of mine. Very good friend of mine. Oh, man, I'm going to check him right after this. <laughs> oh, oh, you're selling me a check up on that. I mean, I check into your presentation tonight. What... What a great presentation you gave us here tonight, brother. But one question I'd like to ask, how do you fuse or infuse character into these seven seats? So I think character is in all of the seven seats, right? So particularly when I talk about credibility, credibility is all about character and trust, right? And I think also values, right? So when we talk about courage, that's a character trait. Are you courageous or are you fearful, right? I think calling is for me a spiritual uh, 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 character point. You know, a sense of calling, it was not something that I 
looked up or just found um, and, and yes, schooling and some of that, you know, education help, but calling is a character trait by being spiritual and having my relationship uh, with God. Uh, I think resiliency, when I talk about change, that's a character uh, trait and the ability to bounce back. So I think Ola, you're hitting the nail on the head because I think character runs through all of the uh, 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 the seven C's.